So let me get this straight. Getting this cured doesn't keep you from being permanently healed, doesn't keep you from being even temporarily healed, doesn't keep you from being sick, doesn't keep you from transmitting it to other people. And we're supposed to buy this? No, I'm not talking about the vaccination. I'm talking about being delivered from a demon. I know what I described to you might sound similar, eerily similar to what we've gone through with this uh, vaccination stuff. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when people tell you that you need to have a demon cast out of your issues are demonic. Your issues are that you are being demonized. Let's be clear, ladies and gentlemen, there is no biblical standing for a Christian having a demon. Now, can a non-Christian be possessed? Can a non-Christian be demonized? Whatever the word that's used, don't let people also come back and tell you that the Greek word daimonixomai means that you can be demonized, oppressed, influenced. They simply don't understand the word. You cannot find a good sound grammarian that will tell you that's what this word means and that it's any different than being possessed, influenced, oppressed. It literally means the same thing. That's why you see it used differently or interchangeably in the Bible with someone who has a demon, being possessed, oppressed, causing sickness and things like that. How does that work? Well, we don't have to get all the way into the weeds as to how demonization works with non-believers because no one here is doubting or saying that non-believers, non-Christians cannot have a demon. The issue is, can a Christian have a demon? Now, remember the word for uh, deliverance in the Old Testament. One of the words is Yeshua, which is to deliver. He is our deliverer. And Jesus said that he's come to set the captives free, to deliver these people. The question is, did he or did he just do it partially? Because if he didn't do it, but then some other man can come back after him and then do what Jesus did not do, well, then who has more power? And there are those that will tell you that greater things that he will do that we will do, will do the same thing that he did and greater. And so Jesus came about casting out demons. That was the majority of what he did. No, it's not. There are 10 recorded times in the scriptures where Jesus cast out demons. Do we think that he did it more than that? I'm sure he did, but we only have 10 recorded times, which means it is not the most important thing that he came to do, as some will have you believe. We don't have one example not one example of anyone having a demon who also has the Holy Spirit in them. And that makes sense. One, Jesus says, and look what he's talking about in John 8. Let's start in 34, because some are going to say, well, in context, he's not talking about what you're talking about, Corey. But let's see. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. So he's speaking of just this total life in the in the uh, in Christ that you are free, free from what? Well, from sin, whatever effects that sin can have on you, whatever effects of anything outside of the son can have on you, it is done away with. It is nullified. You are free. And this word antos means indeed you are without question free. But how are you free indeed? yet still troubled by a demon. And there are those that will tell you, you can have a demon today, have the demon cast out of you, and then the demon will come back. You could also be around people who are demonized and then catch a demon from them. We don't see what they're saying in scripture. All we do know is that if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you are subject to any and everything. But having the Holy Spirit, you are not. Why? Because the Bible tells us in 1 John 4, he says, you are from God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who's in the world. Greater is who? The greater that's the he that's in you that's greater is the Holy Spirit. The one that's in the world is whatever demonic spirit that could be. It clearly isn't God's spirit that's in the world because he says he's in you. And so are we to say, are we to believe that a Christian having the Holy Spirit can then have that spirit uprooted by a demon? But a human being has the power to cast that demon out. The very same power to cast a demon out, the Holy Spirit couldn't do it himself. Think about that. So now we are ranking in higher in hierarchy our powers over the demons who have power over the Holy Spirit. Does that even begin to make sense? Why does Peter, why does neither Peter, nor Paul, nor James, nor John, nor Jude, nor the writer of Hebrews, no one in the Bible tells us, one, how to go about casting out demons. Two, no one tells believers after the church is founded to cast demons out. 
As a matter of fact, the last time that we see a demon cast out is in the, the last people group before the last people group in the New Testament, which is John's disciples. We don't see this happen after Acts 19. We don't see Christians having demons. Why is that? If it was as big of an issue then as it is today, why then don't we hear it spoken about? Why didn't Paul write any letters to the church? All the things that were happening in the body in Corinth, maybe in Ephesus, other places. Why didn't Paul say, you know what your problem is? You have a demon. We don't see that. Why? Because it's a non-existent issue. If you have the Holy Spirit. Remember what the Bible says, Satan walks around like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. But what is what is Peter's response? Cast a demon out? No. He says to be on alert, be sober. As a matter of fact, James tells us that when he does come, resist him. Simply resist him, draw near to God, and then he'll draw near to you. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and what will he do? He will flee. If the devil will flee, then does that also require or mean that demons will do the exact same thing? We're told that these demonic things can't hurt us. Does it mean we won't ever have any encounter with them? That doesn't mean that we're going to have, there's always going to be demonic influence around and about us, but not centered in us. It cannot be. So if you have a demon, you're not a Christian. If you're Christian, you can't have a demon. Does that mean that you can't have any bad days or things happening? Can there be any weight or sin that can kind of get in your way? Sure. But we don't see this happening. We don't see the apostles with demons. We don't see in the disciples, deacons. We don't see anyone with the spirit in them having demons. Do not fall into this lie, this trap. And I'm not trying to impugn all the people that believe that you can have a demon. But what I am telling you is that not one, not one of them understand the scriptures well enough to believe or to understand what is teaching. God has come so that we can have life, that we can have it abundantly. You cannot have an abundant life with a demon inside you. It just cannot be. There's a reason why these people tend not to want to have this conversation. They'll have the conversation with each other but they won't have a conversation with someone that is going to refute them. They're going to hold them accountable using the scriptures to make them prove their point. The Bible is interested in your walk with him. The Bible is interested in what the Holy Spirit does in you to show you that one, trust in him, have faith in him, and then live that out. And so in Ezekiel and places like that, when he tells us that the Holy Spirit will come in us and then cause us to walk in his teaching, cause us to walk this way, but then we turn around and say, a demon can come in and break that up. Well, now we're giving more power to some created being than we have the creator. And I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen, reject that. If you think you can have a demon, fine. You'll live your life in a more difficult fashion than you need to. You'll blame things on demons when they're not there, when simply all you have to do is submit more to the Lord. And how we know the proof is in the pudding? Ask yourself, who listens to people that believe what I believe and who listens to people who believe what these other people that say that you can have a demon, ask yourself, the people that the two different audiences, who has more demons? We don't see people that subscribe to what I subscribe to, walking around, being bound down, um, held under, oppressed, demonized, what have you. But over here, we see that. Which hospital do you want to be at? The one where no one gets healed? The one where no one is feeling good? The one where everyone has a demon, the one where everyone is oppressed or the one where everyone is leaning on the Lord and are full of joy. I think the choice is pretty easy. I think if we were in sales. It'd be a no brainer. And so, yes, you know what? Using it that way, we are in sales. I'm selling you what the scriptures say, not what's not what someone believes or what someone feels. So I would say to you, choose which route you'd like to take the one where there's freedom the one where there's no oppression, or the one where you have to fight off imaginary demons. You decide.